Hello everybody, it's Dr. Tamara here. Tuesday night, rapid fire Q&A. Here we are yet again. These weeks just seem to be flying by. I don't know about you. I actually, you're not going to believe this, I actually received my first save the date for a Christmas function today. Can you believe it? (laughs) It's not even July. It's not even the end of financial year and I got my first save the date for a Christmas party. I'm kind of, my mouth hit the floor, couldn't believe it. How are you all for a Tuesday night? It's a bit chilly over here in Perth. I am guessing many of you are coming from Perth. Uh, if you're not, say hi, let us know where you're coming from. I've got a qu- couple of questions that have come through. Now, what time is it? 7.30. Okay, exactly on the dot. So let's go for 10 minutes. If you do have any quick rapid fire questions please don't hesitate to pop them in the chat remember remember the rules keep it generic keep them short and sweet we don't want your life story Uh, and you'll be getting a short sweet generic answer that will hopefully apply to others who might be watching all right so i had one question today um, with regards to someone who has had a few, what we actually call biochemical pregnancies. Um, what that simply means, a biochemical pregnancy is just where we actually do a blood test and we find a positive um, quantitative beta-HCG, so pregnancy hormone, that goes up and then unfortunately drops back to baseline again. But a pregnancy itself, a clinical pregnancy, was not seen in the uterus or anywhere else for that matter. So that's what's called a biochemical pregnancy. It's not a very nice term, I agree, um, but I guess it, it, it kind of explains that conception has taken place. So sperm and egg have fertilised, created at least a day five embryo that has um, somewhat implanted, but they're not, they're not continued on. So someone asked the question, if, you, if you're tracking a cycle and looking at the progesterone levels in the mid luteal phase, so, in, so presuming that the second half of the cycle is, is 14 days, which is standard, uh, mid luteal is measuring the blood at around about seven days post ovulation. So the question was around if you're seeing an elevation in the progesterone level, um, is that not reassuring uh, in the context of of recurrent biochemical pregnancy uh, losses? Well, the the simple answer is probably not. A one-off progesterone um, may not be sufficient. It certainly has said to us, yes, you've ovulated because... Uh, you start to produce progesterone from that ovulatory follicle uh, in the second half of the cycle, which then matures the lining to enable a little embryo to implant in that window of implantation, which is anywhere from six to 10 days after ovulation. But there is the concept of luteal phase deficiency. Now, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, there are people out there who have this shortened uh, luteal phase. It's less than 14 days, um, which does suggest that there is some defect in that that may impact on implantation or impact on an ongoing pregnancy. And so just because you've got presence of progesterone in that mid luteal and it might be rising in that mid luteal phase doesn't mean that it won't, you won't experience an early drop off and therefore... Uh, I suppose, a luteal phase defect. So I'm hoping that might answer the question. So one of the things I certainly do when I'm looking at recurrent pregnancy losses uh, is look to see if there is an ongoing and then stabilisation uh, in that progesterone right through until day 14 after ovulation. So that's one of the things that I look at is a serial measure of the progesterone levels over time. Hopefully that was helpful. I did have another question from Janet. Congratulations, Janet, on the birth of your beautiful baby. Um, Janet was asking a question about IVF and placenta accreta. And um, and whether or not they're, they're related. And so, again, the simple answer to that is yes. There was actually a large systematic review of a number of studies published just last year, actually, 2021 which looked at, was a meta-analysis, so it collected all this data from lots and lots of different studies, and they compared around about 200,000 
pregnancies that had been conceived after IVF with about 200,000 pregnancies that had been conceived spontaneously. And they actually did find an increase in placenta accreta rates. This is all registry based, of course. Um, they did find an increased rate of placenta accreta in pregnancies conceived through IVF compared to spontaneously conceived pregnancies. In fact, it was, a, it was an odds ratio of about five. So it's a five times increased chance of you having a placenta accreta from I, after IVF than if you spontaneously conceived, which is kind of surprising. Now, what placenta accreta is, if you didn't know, is where the placenta actually embeds into the muscle layer of the uterus, not the endometrium, which is that decidual layer that, that can be um, lost and therefore the placenta comes away really easily at childbirth, but into the muscle, which you can probably hear the shenanigans going through, going behind me in the house, um, but which can increase the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, difficulty in removing that placenta. And in some women, they have a, a terrible situation of having a, um, a hysterectomy at the time of childbirth because they just can't stop the bleeding. Um, and, and in many cases, it's diagnosed um, during the, the antenatal um, course because it's it has a very distinctive appearance at ultrasound so it's quite surprising actually when some women have a placenta accreta diagnosed at childbirth it can be quite surprising and um, quite challenging for the obstetrician to then manage at childbirth so the simple answer to the question is yes uh, placental anomalies are more associated with IVF placenta accreta has a five times increased incidence after IVF and it's possibly due to a number of things. One of those things is that we know for sure that there is an increased rate of placenta um, previa, which is where the placenta is low lying at the time uh, of pregnancy in an IVF uh, compared to as spontaneously conceived. And it's thought something thought due to the, the differences in endometrial thickness. There are also placental placement um, issues um, and high incidence of placenta previa and also high incidence of placenta accreta in frozen embryo transfers using HRT versus frozen embryo transfers where a natural cycle uh, is undertaken. So I suppose that's another vote in favour of a natural cycle over an HRT cycle. I think I've spoken to you about the preeclampsia risks as well. So there are, and there's lots of other potential reasons. In fact, in this big systematic review, they also looked at, um, now let me go back into the deep, dark depths of my memory on this one. They also looked at women who had IVF and then also had a spontaneous pregnancy. Actually, no, it was the other way around. They looked at women who'd had a spontaneously pregnancy, a spontaneous pregnancy, and then women later on having an IVF pregnancy and they found a higher incidence in one woman of placenta accreta in the woman having IVF compared to when she had a spontaneous pre pregnancy. Now that could be associated with other complicating factors like the fact that she was a bit older, maybe she'd had a cesarean delivery and we know that cesarean deliveries increase the risks of placenta accreta as well. Um, so there are lots of uh, confounding factors there as well. But it, it does bring light to the fact that this is something that's really important to appreciate. IVF is not without risk. You know, all of us IVF specialists, fertility specialists, would much prefer someone to have a spontaneously conceived pregnancy than we would to put you through IVF because IVF has risks. Uh, it has risks in the treatment. It has risks in the egg collection. Um, it has risks with the embryo transfers. Um, and as you can see, there are pregnancy associated risks as well. And it's really, really important that everyone out there understands, um, that the risks associated with, um, with IVF, uh, and you know, you're well aware of it before, uh, undertaking it. So it's really important to understand, do you really need it? 
am I someone that actually needs IVF? Is, is that the right treatment for me? Because there are risks associated with it. So hopefully that would be, that's helpful to you. All right, there's been a few more questions that have been dropped in there that I had to go back into the recesses of my brain with that one. Okay, uh, is it still considered biochemical preservative, only positive urine HCG, then says blood's a week later with GP negative. Um, uh, yes, it would be like, still considered a biochemical pregnancy. Good question. Um, thank you very much. Um, any other questions there? What progesterone would you be hoping for in the first few weeks of pregnancy? Oh, look, I think that you would want to have a progesterone when you do your positive blood test, um, which generally you would do just after you think you might have missed a period. I, I would expect that to be well above 70. Um, so, yeah. And then it, it will change. It, it, will, it will stay stable. It will go up. It might drop just a little bit. But you, you really want it to be up well above probably 70 to 75, uh, that first progesterone level. Um, we will usually, usually support you with extra progesterone for that belts and braces approach anyway. But don't get too hung up in the numbers, okay? Because <laughs> that could prov provoke a little bit of anxiety. Good questions, though. Good questions. All right. Oh, have I seen any more? Any more questions there, guys? There's some good ones today. We've just hit 10 minutes. Any more questions? Any more questions? So I was listening to a really fascinating podcast today about the impact of neurotransmitters and anxiety on, on health and well-being. Um, and it really got me thinking around who we are today, <clears throat> you know, what we're addicted to as far as the immediacy of things, um, how many of us are really addicted to that dopamine hit uh, that we get from, say, likes on social media. Hey, I'm just looking at all the love and I'm loving it. There's my dopamine hit for the day. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important for us to, to really consider when we are doing IVF and fertility treatment, how important it is to manage our mindset, how important it is to manage our emotions, manage our expectations, um, really make sure that we are leaning into those skills that we're developing around resilience and peace and mindfulness because, you know, at a cellular neurotransmitter level, it's going to have an impact. Can't measure it. Uh, I'm yet to really delve into the research around uh, anxiety and mindset and how that impacts on, on IVF, but I know that it has some impact. Um, so, yeah, that podcast really got me thinking about that. Uh, someone's asked the question, what causes slow cell division in embryos? Generally, the embryo is abnormal, it's abnormal in some way. Uh, and that's where something like time-lapse imaging is really helpful. Uh, although the studies haven't really shown us a direct relationship between poor development in a time-lapse uh, imaging modality, incubator, uh, and aneuploidy rates, but we certainly know that if there are things that are abnormal in development early on, such as slow cell division, slow um, progression from, uh, from different time points in an expected embryo's development, we do know that that is likely to be due to the embryo being abnormal, the most common being that they are chromosomally abnormal, too much or not enough chromosomes. All right. Yes, mum in the making, it is hard. I know, I don't have one patient that has ever sat in front of me and said, geez, tomorrow that was fantastic, let's do it again. <laughs> this is no one ever. So I know it's hard, um, but really lean into those, I guess, skills that you're developing in this journey. All right, gals and guys, if there are any there, I think I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been really fun. I have... Uh, I'm going to get to bed. I've got a gym session tomorrow morning. <laughs> I've got to get too early. I'm back in training. I'm back in training. I'm about to start another challenge. <sighs> I'll keep you, uh, keep you informed. And I've got to go do my push-ups for the push-up challenge. Anyone out there doing the push-up challenge? How's your pec muscles? Ouch. <laughs> I'm getting stronger though. All right, guys and gals. See you later. Thanks for joining me. Bye.